Hi everyone and welcome to the online worship service of Epworth United Methodist Church here in Marion, Ohio. I'm Reverend Jennifer Bass and it is great to be in worship with you all, even across the many miles. Friends, today is the seventh Sunday after Pentecost, and here at Epworth, we are uh, right uh, in the midst of Vacation Bible School. We uh, have had a fantastic week of children's ministry with 45 children and around 25 uh, um volunteers in, in children's ministry. It has been a wonderful uh, week of ministry as we have been celebrating Wild About God uh, at our Vacation Bible School program. So I just want to thank all of you for your constant and faithful support of all of our missions and ministries through Epworth United Methodist Church. Thank you for your giving. Thank you for your prayers. Thank you for all of the ways that you make sure that the church is fully resourced to serve our community. In Jesus' name, we are extremely grateful. Friends, let us enter into worship together today. Our call to worship is this. Though people in our lives sometimes treat us unfairly or with cruelty, Though this world is filled with injustice, O oh God, you never turn your back on us or hide your face from us. Though others try to take away our hope, God, you constantly assure us of a hopeful future, and it is enough. When we try to dictate our fears to you, you invite us to follow you in a relationship of trust. As we struggle to shape our lifestyle to yours, you carry us with you wherever we go. You speak your good news to our hearts, and it is enough. Though we have done nothing to earn them, God, you pour out your gifts of grace and mercy upon us. When we stumble, you set us back on our feet again to follow you into the kingdom. You speak your peace and your unfailing presence, O God, and it is enough. We declare you are the God who sees us. Thank you, Lord, for your love. Friends, our opening hymn today is my all-time favorite hymn, Praise to the Lord the Almighty. Let's lift our voices in worship to God. Our scripture reading for today comes to us from the Old Testament, from the Hebrew Bible, Genesis chapter 16, verses 1 through 16. I invite you to hear these words. 
Now Sarai, Abram's wife, had not been able to bear children for him, but she had an Egyptian servant named Hagar. So Sarai said to Abram, The Lord has prevented me from having children. Go in to my servant. Perhaps I can have children through her. And Abram agreed with Sarai's proposal. So Sarai, Abram's wife, took Hagar, the Egyptian servant, and gave her to Abram as a wife. This happened ten years after Abram had settled in the land of Canaan. He went into Hagar, and she became pregnant. But when Hagar knew she was pregnant, she began to treat her mistress Sarai with contempt. Then Sarai said to Abram, This is all your fault. I put my servant into your arms, but now that she's pregnant, she treats me with contempt. The Lord will show who's wrong, you or me. Abram replied, Look, she is your servant, so deal with her as you see fit. Then Sarai treated Hagar so harshly that Hagar finally ran away. The angel of the Lord found Hagar beside a spring of water in the wilderness along the road to Shur. The angel said to her, Hagar, Sarai's servant, where have you come from and where are you going? I'm running away from my mistress, Sarai, she replied. The angel of the Lord said to her, return to your mistress and submit to her authority. Then he added, I will give you more descendants than you can count. And the angel also said, You are now pregnant and will give birth to a son. You are to name him Ishmael, which means God hears, for the Lord has heard your cry of distress. This son of yours will be a wild man, as untamed as a wild donkey. He will raise his fist against everyone, and everyone will be against him. Yes, he will live in open hostility against all his relatives. Thereafter, Hagar used another name to refer to the Lord who had spoken to her. She said, You are the God who sees me. She also said, Have I truly seen the one who sees me? That well was named Be'er Lahai Roi, which means well of the living one who sees me. It can still be found between Kadesh and Bered. So Hagar gave Abram a son, and Abram named him Ishmael. Abram was 86 years old when Ishmael was born. The word of God for all of God's people. Thanks be to God. Let's take a few moments together and let's pray today. Heavenly Father, as we spend a few moments in prayer to you, we are grateful for this reminder from the scriptures that you see us. It is such a comfort and it is such a gift. God, there are many times in our lives where we wonder if anyone at all sees and notices us. If anyone's listening, if anyone cares. It is such a wonderful reminder, God, that your eyes are constantly attentive to us, that you call us by name, that you are constantly aware of the details of the things going on in our lives, and that you care very much for us. God, thank you for this story from the scriptures. God, in the same way that you were mindful and aware of all that was going on for Hagar, we are so grateful for your care for us, and we are grateful for your care for our loved ones, for our communities, and for this world. God, we lift up to you today all of those who are in need of your healing touch. We think of those in our lives and in our neighborhoods who are in need of your healing, those who are hospitalized and undergoing medical treatment. We think of those who are grieving the loss of loved ones and going through hard times and hard situations. God, thank you for your provision and your care for us. God, we pray today for our communities. We pray for our world. 
thank you for being with us in every season and in every circumstance. We pray all of these things in the name of the one who taught us to pray together by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. How many of you have a dog who can instantly sense the very moment when you sit down with some food? I sure do. And his name is Oliver Hardy Bass. Ollie Bass, the cutest and most obnoxious dog in the world. As most of you know by now, Jared and I are not able to have children, so what we have instead is dogs. Two 24-pound Boston Terriers, to be exact. Daisy Duke Buchanan Bass and her little brother, Oliver Hardy Twist Bass. Both cute as a button, both highly food-motivated. Do you think those dogs can hear the doorbell? Nope. Do you think that they can hear the guys tromping around the house spraying the lawn with fertilizer? No. But do you think they can hear the slightest crinkle of any plastic wrapper in the kitchen from all the way on the other side of the house? That's a bingo. And do you think that they will leave me and Jared alone for one moment when we're trying to have dinner at the dining room table? Not a chance. They're right there at our knees, especially Ollie, looking up at us, begging for a little scrap of food, staring up at us. If Ollie's face could communicate, he would be singing that radio song made famous by Adele. Hello? It's me, I was wondering if after these three minutes you would feed me. <laughs> but here's the thing, I mean, we love those dogs. And as they're human caretakers, we've got our eyes on them very attentively to make sure that they've got everything they need because those little animals are entirely dependent on us. And we love them. Maybe you have a pet in your life and so you know what I mean. You may have pets, children, a spouse, houseplants, aging parents, beloved friends that you care for or maybe that you have cared for at some point in, in your life. And so maybe you know what it's like when someone or something depends upon you. Friends, that's our entry point for today's scripture passage. Today we continue in our sermon series called, Lord, I Want to Know You. Kathy Swanger, Epworth's Director of Ministries for Children, Youth, and Families, talked to us about Bible study on the last Sunday in the month of June. And she talked about the importance of getting to know God through regular study of Scripture and regular reflection and meditation on Christian writing so that all of us can grow in our relationship with God and with Jesus Christ over time as we study and we get to know God through His Word. And then on 4th of July Sunday, we talked about prayer. We talked about back and forth communication with God as we consistently get to know the Lord by spending time, by taking our requests and our worries, our praises and our petitions to God and then listening to God's spirit in return so that God's peace overflows in our hearts and in our minds and so that God's peace sets up guard in our lives. And then last Sunday, we talked about liturgy, the work of the people, time spent in worship as a congregation. It is a crucial way of getting to know God. When we come to church, when we come to worship, we are not the audience God is the audience of our worship as all of us co-create worship. So you and I come to know God by time spent together as a congregation week after week 
year after year, using some of the forms that have been handed down to us through the centuries from the ancient church, congregational prayer, singing, and sacred moments like Holy Communion and Baptism. Now this Sunday and the next few Sundays, we'll be taking a look at some of the Hebrew names of God that we read about in the Old Testament. And as we consider the names of God that we learn about from God's Word, those names of God can deeply impact our Bible study, our prayer time, and how we worship and engage in liturgy and in church. Learning some of the names of God from the Bible can help you and me to truly know God's character and know God's heart. They can truly help us to know God better. So in today's scripture reading, we turn to Genesis 16, verses 1 through 16, where an Egyptian servant named Hagar says, You are the God of seeing. For truly, I have seen the one who looks after me. Another translation puts it like this. You are the God who sees me, for I have now seen the one who sees me. In Hebrew, the name that Hagar gave to God was El Roi. El Roi, the God who sees me. Sometimes it feels like nobody sees us. Sometimes it feels like nobody's listening and nobody cares. That can be about small things, of course, but then sometimes life is extraordinarily unfair and unjust and cruel, and you just want to run away from it all and give up. You wonder, does God even see me? Does God even care? Friends, the answer is a resounding yes. Let's take a look at Genesis 16 today. Abram, at the age of 75, had been called by God to take his wife Sarai and leave his hometown and go to a land that God had shown him. God promised Abram that God would make a great nation out of him. But then, year after year had ticked by, 11 years since God's promise. And Abram and Sarai were traveling along, following God, waiting for God to make them into that great nation. But they weren't getting any younger, and they still had no babies. So they did what any of us might have done. They circumvented God's timing, and they took matters into their own hands. It is it's difficult and abhorrent to us to imagine today, but these few thousand years later, as we read this scripture passage, we come to find out that Sarai said to Abram, just use my Egyptian servant, Hagar, take her as your wife. If Sarai's servant became pregnant from this union, the child would belong to Sarai and Abram. Maybe that's what God meant, Sarai must have assumed. Maybe that's how God would make Sarai and Abram into a great nation. So Abram got Hagar pregnant at Sarai's insistence. And while it's kind of morally reprehensible, it was culturally normal to have babies by your servants who had absolutely no choice in the matter back then. And then to take those babies as your own legal children. And so this is a picture of Sarah, Sarai and Abram taking God's timing into their own hands and making an utter mess of things. Hagar got pregnant, which is what Sarai wanted. But Sarai was extremely jealous and could not handle it. And Hagar, rightfully angry and resentful at her mistreatment and now pregnant, when Sarai, her owner, had struggled with pregnancy, began to act like a snot. Sarai said to Abram, you did this to me. And Abram was like, whoa, lady. Sarai began to harshly mistreat Hagar. And Hagar finally had enough. And she ran away into the desert. We can only imagine how upset Hagar must have been. The angel of the Lord found Hagar near a spring in the wilderness and said, Hagar, servant of Sarai, where have you come from 
And where are you going? All Hagar could say was, my mistress is a class A jerk. I am never going back there again. Well, that's my paraphrase. According to the text, all Hagar could focus on was the pain of her past. She could only answer where she had come from. She had no answer at all about where she was going. The angel of the Lord gently said, Go back. I've got a plan for you and for your unborn child, but it doesn't include you dying out here. There's a future ahead for both of you. You'll have a son. When he's born, give him the name Ishmael, which means God hears, because the Lord has heard your cry of distress. I will give you more descendants than you can count. Life is not over for you yet, but you have to survive. Go back to the camp. And Hagar's experience of God by the spring in the desert was so life-changing for her. God had called her an Egyptian servant by name that she gave God a name in Hebrew that is only found one time in the entire Bible right here in Genesis 16. Hagar said, you are El Roy, you are the God who sees me. I have seen the God who sees me. Isn't that awesome? An Egyptian servant woman gives God a name. And it gets recorded in the scriptures for all time. And the name she gives God is, You are the God who sees me. You wonder... If God sees you, know by his name that he does. You wonder if God can make anything out of the damage of your past? Know by his name that he can. You wonder if God can bring healing from the trauma you have experienced, even if it was completely out of your hands? Know by his name that he will. You wonder if God is working in your life and the lives of your children and grandchildren, even if they haven't been born yet? Know by his name that he is. He is the God that sees you and he is calling you by name. Many times when someone says God sees you, we picture a God who is like, Santa Claus. He sees you when you're sleeping. He knows when you're awake. He knows if you've been bad or good, so be good for goodness sake. Sometimes the thought of God watching over us brings us great hope, and sometimes it brings us great fear. We think maybe God sees us through a telescope, like he's way up in heaven and we're way down here on earth, and he surely doesn't have time to watch us every hour of the day, so every once in a while he goes to the old telescope and he checks us out so we think hey if we try to do more good than bad then by the law of averages god will catch us feeding the poor or going to church more than he sees us acting a fool in traffic or yelling at the dog or we think maybe god sees us like under a microscope constantly watching our lives closely and carefully to catch us screwing up, scrutinizing every flaw and blemish that can be found, and that as God looks at us under the microscope, he must get angrier and angrier by the minute. But is he either of those? The telescope or the microscope is either of those, I guess I should say, really how God sees us? What's the truth? How does God really see us? Some of you may have come to church today and you feel a lot like Hagar. Resentful, wounded, angry, hurt from injustices, heartaches, traumas, or outright abuse and neglect. Maybe you understand that you've made mistakes and you live with some consequences, or maybe what's confusing and frustrating and hurtful is that 
you live with the consequences of other people's mistakes, like the person who was married too long to an abusive spouse or an adult still trying to cope and recover from the effects of negligent or immature parents or a parent with a rebellious and irresponsible teenager. What is the response of God in heaven to people who have been mistreated? Hagar's gut instinct was just to run away from everything, to try to leave it all behind her, to try to make her way through the desert wilderness. That was preferable to Hagar, to staying in her place of pain and torment. But scripture shows us that Hagar could not outrun God. Where could she go from his presence? In the middle of a desert by a spring in the wilderness, God met Hagar and called her by name and proved to her that he had seen all of it, that he saw her and that he cared very deeply for every detail and circumstance of her life. He wasn't looking through a telescope from a distance of 20 billion light years. He wasn't looking through a microscope at high power magnification with eyes of harsh judgment. God saw her with eyes of love. Friends, in the midst of conflict, in the midst of hardship and heartbreak, when we feel the lost and the loneliest, like nobody quite understands how short the end of the stick is that we've been given, hear me today. God sees. God sees every detail. God is right here. God is calling you by name. God is looking at you with eyes of love. You are not alone. El Roy, the God who sees, the God who saw Hagar in the wilderness all those many years ago, sees you. The God in heaven who created you and gives you purpose, who sits sovereign on his throne, sees you. And the God who sees you can cast a new and a bigger vision for your life, just like God did for Hagar in Genesis 16. God sees a bright future out ahead of us, whether we think we know where we're going or whether we are lost in the desert. I'll catch you up very quickly on the rest of the story. Hagar goes back to the camp and she has a child, Ishmael. Thirteen more years go by. Abram and Hagar's son is now an unruly teenager. And Abram and Sarai still have no babies of their own. Can you imagine the, the state of Sarai's emotion as Emotions as year after year they celebrate Ishmael's birthday and she knows that that baby, that boy, is not hers. Can you imagine Abram thinking to himself year after year, did I mishear God? Did I misunderstand? God help me to have faith in your promises. Then scripture tells us that one day God appears before Abram who is now an old man, and God says, I am God Almighty. I still have a plan and a future for you, and I will give you a child by Sarai, and I will make you a great nation. I am changing both your names because your identity is cemented in me. You will be Abraham, and she will be Sarah. Those name changes add the sound of breath as if God is breathing his breath into their very names, into their very identity. And God says, I want you to name your child Isaac, meaning one who laughs, one who rejoices. Abraham was 99 years old when this happened. He had waited for 25 years for God to make good on the promise of a miracle child between him and Sarah so that he would begin to become a great nation. 25 years 
of waiting for God to keep God's word in God's perfect timing. But friends, listen, God does see. God is still El Roy, the God who saw Hagar and Ishmael, the God who saw Abram and Sarai, Abraham and Sarah, the God who sees you, the God who sees us. May God's holy name inform our study, our prayer, and our worship today and every day. And may God's holy name walk with you always. Amen. Scripture tells us, The name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous run into it, and they are saved. Scripture also tells us, Some trust in horses and some trust in chariots, but we trust in the name of the Lord. May each of us trust in the strong name of our God, the one who sees us, the one who loves us. I pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. Go in peace.